Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering thematic walking tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director of the company, and as always, thank you so much for joining us for the episode. Today, we'll be speaking to Dr. Gregory Cloggis about his new book, The Many Deaths of Tom Thompson, Separating Fact from Fiction. Tom Thompson is an immense figure in Canadian history, but his death on Canoe Lake in Algonquin Park has been the source of quite a bit of controversy. Was it an accidental drowning? Was it suicide? Or could it have been murder? Before we get to that discussion, I wanted to let you know that we have opened up a Snapchat account, which we are having a great deal of fun with. So if you are on Snapchat, definitely uh, look to connect with us. Our username is hauntedwalk, all one word. Dr. Gregory Cloggis is trained as a historian and public policy researcher. He has served as an adjunct faculty member at the University of Guelph-Humber, York University, Ryerson University, and the Ontario College of Art and Design. He is the research director for Death on a Painted Lake, the Tom Thompson Tragedy, one of 12 archival websites produced by the international award-winning Great Unsolved Mysteries in Canada History Project. His research concerning Thompson has appeared in Canadian and American publications, newspapers, and he's appeared on television and radio as well. Dr. Cloggis, thank you so much for joining us today. You're more than welcome. I'm glad to be here. I really enjoyed reading your new book, The Many Deaths of Tom Thompson, Separating Fact from Fiction. In many ways, I felt almost like I was reading detective notes as you were putting together the various accounts, uh, finding the inconsistencies, the similarities, a really fascinating read, and certainly I I recommend it uh, to our listeners. I'm wondering if you could, before we get into the details of his, his death, maybe for listeners who may be unfamiliar with Tom Thompson, who was he, and I guess, why is he important, perhaps, in Canadian history? Sure, I think that's a that's a really good question to to begin with. Um, Tom Thompson, probably for the the average Canadian, even whether they are familiar with his name or not, likely are familiar with the imagery from some of his paintings. They've encountered them probably in their public school library or um, popular calendars, jigsaw puzzles. He's almost, but I shouldn't even say almost. He's part of Canadian cultural iconography. He uh, he was a landscape painter who painted really from about 1912 to 1917, the year he died. And uh, before that, he had worked, and even during that time period, he worked as a designer both in the U.S. and in Canada. But he didn't really come to public attention until years long after his death. Part of the way he came to wider public attention is that he painted with and influenced uh, another group of men who went on to form the Group of Seven, which is a, a group of painters probably that most Canadians n- know about in some way or another. Essentially, they focused on the Canadian landscape and were really noteworthy because they were seen as the first real sort of Canadian school of art, that they, didn't, uh, they, they weren't seen as painting like Europeans. They painted the Canadian landscape, not the European landscape. And so they're really part of what's seen as the, the, the foundation of a Canadian cultural sensibility. And Thompson, they turned to, they recognized as one of their inspirations, one of the guys who drove them to do what they did. And so it's the case that really his art became well-known and valuable than many years after his death? He sold very uh, few public works while he was alive, um, essentially one to the National Gallery of Canada and one to the provincial government. Beyond that, m- most of the works he sold were very small little pieces sort of to friends and acquaintances, but uh, he didn't really come to public or wider public attention until the 1920s when the Group of Seven were reaching national and international attention. And so if uh, one of our listeners was interested in in acquiring one of Tom Thompson's uh, works, what type of price range are we looking at here if we wanted to own an original uh, Thompson? Uh, I I think the highest value they've sold for at auction, for one of his larger pieces, um, most recently in the last year or two, I believe was almost $3 million. Uh, those larger works are are a bit more rare. He also made lots of smaller works. For instance, when he was in Algonquin Park or traveling, he made small pieces, often size of a, a eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper or smaller. But of course, 
those haven't been made for a hundred years. So when they do sell, they still sell as well for sometimes upwards of six figures. I suppose it is a combination of his artistic talents, which we think are quite significant, but also this idea of being kind of a, a rugged outdoorsman, a woodsman that, that tie into this real, real Canadian notion. Could you tell us a little bit about, I guess in particular, you know, kind of what his daily life was like at Canoe Lake in, in Algonquin Park? Um, you know, what, what, type of, what type of guy was he? What, he was interested in fishing and hunting and those types of things? Uh, some of those things certainly we have evidence of him doing. Um, and, and perhaps I can put what he was doing at Canoe Lake in a bit of a larger context of the, his life outside of Canoe Lake as well, in that um, for about the last five years of his life, he would spend a little more than half the year uh, at Canoe Lake in Algonquin Park. And <clears throat> during his, usually his summers there, spring, summer, fall, uh, he would do a variety of jobs. So he would spend some time painting. He would spend some time guiding parties around the park, uh, outsiders who come to holidays, so fishing parties and the like. He would spend some time helping out the people who lived in the park. So he often stayed at a place called Moet Lodge. So he might help them take care of the lodge. He might help them put in their garden, these kinds of things. Essentially, think of him kind of as a, a self-employed jack-of-all-trades. During the winter months, uh, he would usually work in Toronto, sometimes working at design firms. So, uh, of course, um, during this time period, what he would be doing would be hand-drawing advertisements for newspapers, magazines, and the like. And uh, also, at the same time, he lived in pretty simple circumstances in Toronto, uh, in a shack behind the studio building that he sometimes painted in, and he would work at converting smaller paintings that he had made in the summer, you know, from his canoe or from the shoreline, etc., converting those into larger works. So he would spend his summers, think of it sort of like doing research, making on-the-spot small paintings, and the wintertime he would be converting the most promising ones to big, larger works. What I found really fascinating about the book um, while reading it was come some of the mis- conceptions I had. Uh, we did, I did do a little bit of uh, uh, one of our previous shows on this topic with uh, Professor Dimitri Anastakis. I believe it was episode four. And in researching it and talking to him about it, I always pictured Canoe Lake as kind of this extremely isolated, you know, Thompson up there by himself kind of thing. But I was really surprised in the book to read about kind of the community around the area. At least it seemed like there was quite a few kind of regulars around. Absolutely, and I and I think this is one of the one of the misconceptions, both where Thompson was painting and some of the aspects of his life. Canoe Lake was at one time the headquarters for Algonquin Park were positioned there. It was also the site of a former lumber company operation. So uh, the building, for instance, Moat Lodge that Thompson was staying in was a former lumber company building. And most of the other facilities there were lumber company facilities. The former headquarters of the park were in a former lumber company facility. And there were people who congregated to serve the tourists. So, um, for instance, Shannon and Annie Fraser, who ran the lodge where Thompson was staying. There were also people who stayed at the neighboring lake and, and ran a similar operation there. There were guides who lived in the region year-round. There were, there were I can't say a lot of people, but probably a population, a regular population, between about 20 and 50 people in the vicinity. And then, of course, in the summertime, that would also... Uh, balloon as people sort of came in and out holiday. And have you had the opportunity to visit the lake yourself? Absolutely, yes. And what are your impressions of the spot for those of us who haven't been? Well, it's a it's a bit of a funny thing because, of course, I think for many now, uh, we think of Algonquin Park as this great undisturbed wilderness. But that's not the way it would have been 100 or 110, 120 years ago. A lot of the imagery that Thompson made of Canoe Lake featured lumber company machinery, deadheads, cut logs, all these sorts of things. And, and 100 years ago, part of the area that was very close to where Thompson was staying, Moat Lodge, was something called the Chipyard. It was a shallow area of Canoe Lake that the lumber company operating there had dumped a lot of lumber waste into the lake, uh, essentially to create a flat, dry area to stack and store lumber. If you go there today, that area is still very shallow. 
Um, you know, sometimes even in a canoe, your canoe can kind of rub up against the, the, the bottom of the lake. But there is still lots of cut wood and wood waste sort of floating around in that area, laying on the, the bottom of the lake that's quite easily visible. So that, that history of the lumber business at Canoe Lake is still quite visible if you know where to look for it. And I'm wondering, do, do tourists come to the lake specifically now still to kind of take take part in the story? And is there any um, uh, ornamentation, statue, plaques, or anything that on the lake? There are a few things there. So, for instance, um, one of the companies that operate on Canoe Lake, renting out canoes and that people use as kind of a, a starting point for longer trips into the park, they have maps available of some of the prominent Thompson-related sites around Canoe Lake. So that suggests certainly that they have enough of an audience or people asking for them that they've taken time to design it and print it off. Uh, around Canoe Lake, there are a few things related to Thompson's life that you can see. So there is a part of the lake called Hayhurst Point. And on Hayhurst Point, which is reputedly an area that Thompson sometimes liked to camp, there are two things. There's a memorial cairn that was erected in the fall of 1917 by uh, some of his friends. And also there is a totem pole that was erected close by, uh, if I remember correctly, in the mid-1940s um, that was also sort of a tenuous connection, but seemed related to this idea of appreciating or commemorating Thompson's life. The third sort of, and a little bit more mysterious um, or, or distant connection is there is a cemetery not too far from the lake, which is where Thompson was originally buried. At that cemetery, just outside of the fence, there is a small white wooden cross planted into the ground. And some have said this is where Thompson was originally buried, and others suggest actually that's not the case at all, that, that it was put there by a film crew in the 1960s who were making a documentary about Thompson and needed to have you know something visual to focus on, and so they put it there. We will get to kind of where Tom Thompson is buried or not buried, I think, in a, in a moment. But maybe if you can take us back, we know that the story of his his death has changed, uh, been embellished, uh, it has changed considerably from 1917. But if we were there, you know, a week or two later, even a year later, what is the basic story we would hear from the locals about, I guess, the, the day he went out on the water and the week or so, a little bit more, that followed. How we talk about this case certainly has changed over the last hundred years. And even people who were there on site, their versions of that story have changed um, over the decades following. So in terms of thinking what actually happened at the time, going back to the evidence from 1917, what we can look at is, uh, for instance, Thompson, in late March, early April, left Toronto to go up to Canoe Lake chose to not go visit his family in Owen Sound because he said he wanted to get up to Canoe Lake as quickly as possible to catch the snows before they finished melting. Uh, so during uh, April and May, he was probably doing some painting up there. Um, he wrote his, uh, his sponsor, his patron, to say, I'm making artwork. Some of them are working out, but some of them aren't, but certainly he seemed to be enjoying himself. He said, I'm going to keep on painting. Um, his patron came to visit him in Canoe Lake during May 1917. In uh, June 1917, we don't hear too much from him, but in early July, he suggests he is still staying at Mowat Lodge, although by then he had hoped to be out camping you know, in a tent somewhere in the park, but the weather had been cold and wet and uh, black flies had been bad, and so he decided to stay in the lodge. Uh, he told his patron that he intended to send him down his spring paintings uh, in the next day or two. He had also been speculating perhaps uh, either heading out to paint the Rocky Mountains or going out late in the summer to help with uh, harvest work, probably in the prairies. Um, and so he, was, he seemed to be making plans. He had booked um, opportunities to guide some fishing parties uh, during July and August of 1917. And on July 8th, uh, a Sunday, uh, he is reported to have, around noon, a little bit after noon, uh, decided to take a short fishing trip. Uh, so he left the dock at Moat Lodge on Canoe Lake, which he knew very well. Um, one or more people saw him depart and waved him off. A couple of hours later, a few people living on the lake saw his canoe floating upside down. 
They didn't report it, however, that day, it seems, and it wasn't until two days later, um, July 10th, that he was reported as missing. When he was reported as missing, the park ranger and uh, one or two other people around the lake instituted a sort of an informal search. They started, they went and talked to the people who saw the canoe, but at the time, their consensus was that he had probably hurt himself, broken his ankle, fallen on a portage, perhaps um, it, camping his canoe had gotten away on him or something like that, and they fully expected that they would find him within the next day or two. Would it be unusual for him to essentially disappear like that? Was he a pretty free spirit, or was it, it was at all unusual for him to be gone, say, uh, overnight unaccounted for? I, I, from from the accounts that we have at the time, it usually wasn't. But uh, one of the key things I think that was mentioned at the time is usually he would give the people at Mowat Lodge, Shannon Fraser, for instance, he would give him some fairly clear notion of when he expected to return. I'll be back tomorrow morning. I'll be back in a week, whatever the case may be. So that someone knew where he was going and what his intentions were. But what we have from the time is no one within the few days of him disappearing suggested, oh my gosh, this is this is something causing us anxiety. They fully expected, oh, he's just injured himself. We've got nothing really to worry about at this point. Uh, certainly, even the park ranger at the time writes in his daily diary uh, that we, we just expect he'll be back in the next day or two. And it didn't seem to cause us any anxiety at the time. When he still doesn't reappear after three or four days, a, a more concerted search is undertaken. Um, after about a week, the searchers are starting to get frustrated. They're thinking, we just don't know what happened here. And on uh, July 16th, uh, a man, Dr. Howland, who was staying at the lake, saw something bob up to the surface and asked a couple of guides canoeing across the lake to take a look. These men rowed over to what had popped up in the water and said, it's Tom Thompson. And so they hauled his body over to the shore. They notified the proper authorities, the park ranger, the park superintendent. Uh, the coroner was summoned from outside the park, and essentially then they waited. 24 hours, the coroner hasn't arrived. Uh, undertakers are there waiting to do something with the body, and his friends are clearly getting quite uncomfortable with uh, what must have been quite a, an unfortunate and gory scene, that their friend who'd been in the water for over a week was clearly deteriorating in the water. And so they asked permission to have a doctor staying at the lake uh, examine the corpse and then to bury him as quickly as possible, which they did. They buried him um, the day after he was found. And did, did they note any uh, strange markings on his body or any other any other red flags that something uh, untoward had happened? Well, it's funny because there's a, it's almost a little bit contradictory. We have two written reports of people who saw Thompson's corpse. One is Dr. Howland, so the, the doctor who examined the remains, and the other is Mark Robinson, the park ranger who uh, was the park authority in that area, and he led the search for Thompson. They both saw Thompson's corpse and left written reports from likely the day they examined the corpse. Both of them note a few things that have been made much of over the last hundred years. One is they suggest that he had a bruise on his temple. Which side of his temple has been debated, or it's not entirely clear, but some sort of bruise on his temple. Uh, they also report that he was bleeding from his ear. Uh, but they both also note that there were no signs of violence to the body, or no signs of what could be understood as foul play. Oh. So this notation of a bruise and bleeding at the time, they did not associate with the body having undergone any particular trauma. And with the, with the body being in the water that length of time, I, I'm obviously not an expert, but I assume there would be some discoloration of the skin or maybe other factors that could make something look like a bruise, I would, I would imagine. Uh, you raise an, uh, a very valuable point. And uh, not being an expert on this either, one of the things I did was ask uh, Ontario's chief forensic pathologist, Dr. Michael Polanin, to weigh in. And so I showed him some of the accounts of the conditions of Thompson's remains and asked him how he might make sense of what was recorded. And he suggested, much like you have, that, of course, a, a body that even at the time was described as being bloated to twice its size, to have flesh peeling off of its limbs, 
He said, you would not be able to authoritatively, authoritatively say that any kind of discoloration was a bruise. Even for that matter, that fluids escaping from the body was a sign of bleeding. It's more likely a sign of decomposition. Gases even escaping from the mouth couldn't necessarily be taken as air in the lungs, but the gas is created by decomposition. And I guess bruises, bruising only occur, the subject has to be alive uh, for bruising to occur would be, I guess, part of that, uh, you know, part of the consideration there as well. Absolutely. Of course, as you, as you note, uh, you must be alive to be bruised. Blood has to be pumping through to be escaping those blood vessels. And so any sort of wound that Thompson might have experienced would likely have to, you know, if, if there was bruising, it would have to have been registered at least a couple of hours before he died. And so the two doctors examine the body, uh, they make the notes as you just, just outlined, and it's then their conclusion that accidental death, drowning, is the obvious cause, and then they bury the body there at the lake? Uh, yeah, actually, just one doctor examined uh, the remains, the Dr. Howland, and the park ranger was the other man. And um, I, I think it's worthwhile to note, and, and we may come up uh, later in our conversation, Howland was a general practitioner, so he wouldn't have been an expert on drowning victims. He certainly wasn't a coroner. And Robinson had served in Europe uh, during World War I. And so he would have had some experience, obviously, with injuries, uh, traumas to the body, etc. Um, but their notes, what they observed, were very similar. Once they were done making their observations, the undertakers prepared the body for burial, and it was buried um, July 17th, the day after it was discovered. But it, it did not stay there. That's correct. Communication out of Canoe Lake was particularly poor at this time. And it's perhaps hard for us to keep in mind, you know, in the area of cell phones and the internet, etc., that communication in and out of Canoe Lake was primarily done by telegraph at this point. And the lines were down between some of the outside points and Canoe Lake. And so getting information, particularly to Thompson's family, who lived in Owen Sound, Ontario, was difficult. They had sent a number of messages by telegraph to Thompson's family and not got any responses. And so they tried connections to others, uh, Thompson's patron, Dr. McCallum, etc., trying to get some advice or information on what to do. In the end, they decided, without getting communication from Thompson's family, that they would bury him at Canoe Lake. This is not what the Thompson family wanted, and discovering that he had been buried at Canoe Lake, they arranged for his body to be exhumed and to be transferred to a family plot uh, in a small town just outside Owen Sound, Ontario, and that was done within a day or two of his burial at Canoe Lake. And then it came to be that there was some suspicion that the body was not, in fact, moved from Canoe Lake. How did that develop? Well, that's a, a, a very interesting, uh, this mystery has a, a number of layers and sort of new aspects to it. Um, at some point between 1917 and the mid-1950s, gossip began to circulate, probably at Canoe Lake, that Thompson's body had never actually been moved. And uh, a few men took it upon themselves in the mid-1950s to test out that gossip. And essentially what their logic was, and I talk about this in the book, their logic was, well, if there is no body in this original burial site, we're not committing any sort of crimes excavating that former grave. That's a bit of a, a tricky legal argument, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a bit of a tricky legal argument. And what they, what they discovered, of course, is they, they went to um, what they believed to be the original burial site, and they started digging just outside of the cemetery fence, and the first hole they dug, they found nothing, and they there was no evidence that the soil had ever been disturbed. So they filled that hole and they started a second one. Same thing. They didn't find anything. They were probably by this point starting to get a bit fatigued, but they noticed a strange depression a little bit further outside of the realm of where they had been digging. They kind of poke around at it a little bit. They start digging there, and lo and behold, they find worked wood. They uh, dig a little bit further and they discover bones. They take their bones to another doctor who is staying on the lake, a Dr. Ebbs, who says these are human remains. And what the men believe immediately is, well, this has got to be Tom Thompson's remains, that this gossip, this rumor is true. But of course, the challenge they now face is they have, without any sort of permission from park authorities or asking anyone's permission, excavated a burial site. Uh, the doctor 
in Canoe Lake in the 1950s, uh, contacts the park authorities and the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, send in investigators who excavate the remains and take them back to Toronto for forensics analysis. It's almost so incredible you want it to be true. When you when you hear that, uh, that the rumors existed that, that he was not moved, they dig in the spot or relatively close to the exact spot they think he's going to be in. What do the scientists in Toronto say once they get a good look at the bones? So uh, Dr. Noble Sharp uh, led the examination of the remains. He took them to Toronto. Uh, they x-rayed the skull. They uh, An anthropologist looked at the remains as well. All of them agreed that these remains were not uh, a man with a European heritage, but were the remains of an Aboriginal man. Um, The other key thing that's useful to note is the remains found in the Canoe Lake burial site appeared to uh, have had a a gunshot wound to the skull. The people who found them, there was a hole in the temple of the skull, and they said, well, this has to be a gunshot, and this means Tom Thompson was murdered. Um, The skull, when it was taken back to Toronto, was x-rayed before any soil was removed from it, and there was no sign of a bullet or bullet casings or anything like that within the skull. And when the uh, the forensics experts in Toronto examined the wound to the skull, they said, this doesn't really resemble a, a gunshot wound. If anything, it more resembles a, a surgical practice, that a hole had been cut into the skull, some sort of operation probably to remove pressure from someone's brain. Uh, And so they said this does not seem to be an indication of murder, and it certainly doesn't seem to be an indication that these remains are Tom Thompson's. So would you say that it's most likely his remains are in the family plot in Owen Sound? I think... Barring any sort of evidence to the contrary, um, I I think this is what we have to conclude to be true. Uh, There have certainly been some who have claimed, for instance, in in a recent book about five years ago, there was the suggestion that the forensics experts in the 1950s got it wrong. But the, the examination done about five years ago, the the primary basis for that argument was based on facial reconstruction of a photograph of the skull. And and as described, the way that that um, facial reconstruction came about, there was an awful lot of leading direction given to ensure that that would look like Tom Thompson. Um, In terms of the evidence we have that the body was removed, we have to think of the various steps involved, that the undertaker who was commissioned to remove the body would have to have not only lied to everyone, but uh, been willing to take that sort of risk, that at no point from that point on would that um, casket ever be opened. Uh, The people who carried the casket would never have thought anything was suspicious. And although some have claimed that people who carried the casket thought it was suspicious, no one who actually carried the casket has spoken out or ever did speak out to say they thought it was suspicious. So I think that's an important point to know. The, uh, The casket also stayed at a funeral parlor in Owen Sound overnight, the day before it was transferred to Leith for reburial. And I think it's worthwhile to consider whether the funeral home director in Owen Sound would not have likely either opened the casket. Uh, it, it, it was a casket meant for shipping on a train, so it probably wouldn't have been very attractive. Also, if the weight was funny or anything like that, that funeral home director would likely have become alerted to the fact and wanted to check out that the work was done properly. So I think there's a number of steps there that... We don't see any alarms going off. We don't see anyone stepping up to say something's not right here. All the suggestions we have that something wasn't right are done long after the fact and are all based on hearsay. And turning back to their findings, that it was most likely an accidental drowning that took place. How does that square up with our knowledge of him as kind of an expert canoeist, as a real nature enthusiast? How do we imagine that may have happened, that he accidentally died while out there um, in his canoe? I think it's an intriguing um, point to start off with, because certainly that is how he is characterized now, as an an expert canoeist, a man of the wilds, attuned to the wilderness. But um, in the 1930s, an author named Blodwin Davies, she had written a biography of Thompson in 1930. And while she was preparing that biography, she actively solicited 
correspondence from Thompson's friends, his family, his acquaintances, people who knew him as a little boy, just trying to get insights into what kind of a person he was. And what I found really intriguing in reading some of these accounts were descriptions of Thompson's swimming ability, his canoeing ability. And one of the things that emerges is a complete lack of consensus that he was actually a good person in a canoe. Uh, We have records of him quite openly admitting to dumping his canoe in rapids, dumping his canoe in unsettled water, uh, sometimes accounts of him not being a particularly good swimmer or canoeer. Uh, He did undertake lots of canoeing trips, no doubt, but it's also worthwhile to consider, as I mentioned earlier, that Canoe Lake was a, uh, had been until about five or six years before he arrived, a very active site for the lumbering industry. There were lots of logs laying underwater. There was lots of floating uh, lumber company waste in the lake. Uh, We have evidence from the time that suggested that people had to kind of plan their routes across the lake around areas that were a little bit dangerous because of floating lumber and what were called deadheads floating in the lake. And it's not at all inconceivable that even if he knew this lake well and was canoeing across on a, on a relatively calm, safe day, that he could have struck something like a deadhead, a log floating just underwater, that even would have um, caused trouble for an experienced canoeist. Before we move into perhaps the more outlandish or exciting possibilities for how his, how his life tragically came to an end, it's quite amazing in the book how you talk about the different eyewitnesses, but how their stories themselves can gradually be changing over time and over the years. What was your perspective as as far as trying to figure out what the truth is? Was it ultimately going back to, to things you could verify with other sources? Was there any kind of gut check here? Because so many aspects of this story are completely conflicted with each other. Absolutely. And I think when I first started looking at this case and was just collecting um you know, various accounts that have been written over the last 90 years. Really, the first biography of Thompson to appear uh, was that 1931 I mentioned previously. And one of the things I noticed is that there were sort of um, periods of a a new story would appear that I I hadn't seen in any previous accounts. And I would think, well, where did this come from? Uh, There would also be spurts of new interest in the case that usually... Uh, were triggered by some new piece of evidence being discovered or coming forward. And part of what got me curious about this story is, well, where did these things come from and how do they accord to or how do they fit with the evidence we have from the time? That I think probably to most people would seem to be the most trustworthy evidence. What were people saying and writing at the time as things happened? Uh, What were they saying and writing down that wasn't necessarily public. So, for instance, the park ranger writing in his daily diary of the events of that day, what sort of things did he record? And what emerged for me is that these stories wildly changed between 1917 and the 1930s, between 1917 and the 1950s, 60s, 70s. I tried to collect and understand as well as possible that documentation, the things recorded in 1917 uh, from about the time period that Thompson went to Canoe Lake until a few months after his death to really understand what people were thinking, what were they concerned about, what were they talking about, and what did they observe at that time. I'd be curious to hear what you think the reasons are for the changing stories. The most obvious one to me, and I'm sure you outlined this in the book, is maybe there's a little cachet for those who were involved in the situation in in telling the story, some media, some press, some notoriety. Is that what you think it is primarily, or do you think there's any other kind of sinister motives involved in the situation? One of the things that's useful to keep in mind is... Who begins to tell different versions of the story? Who begins to step forward? And what might be their relationship to that story? So one of the leading figures, um, and I don't think it's been talked enough, uh, talked about enough with regards to the case, is the park ranger, Mark Robinson. And he left about three accounts between uh, his 1917 diary entries, some letters he wrote in the 1930s, and then a a talk that he gave, probably at Canoe Lake in the 1950s, that was recorded. And in each of those versions, the story he tells is quite different. 
and I and I think one of the things that has been talked about in terms of changes in his accounts, it wasn't that he was seeking to say get into the newspaper or any of those sorts of things, but simply he had an interesting story to tell. People would say, wow, you knew Tom Thompson. You've been around the lake for a long time. What do you know about him? You were here when he died. What can you tell us? And likely telling that story week in, week out, year after year, it can get boring. And so it seemed perhaps harmless. It kept it interesting. It it seemed exciting to elaborate on that tale. So that certainly could be part of it, is just sort of human nature that we want to keep things interesting for ourselves and others. Uh, It could be partly that his thinking changed over time, that as he got further and further from the events, it became easier for him, for instance, to believe that um, things that he didn't know the answers to must be explained by conspiracy. They must be explained by something having gone wrong that he couldn't make sense of. There were also others, of course, who came forward, particularly um, in the 1960s and 1970s, to make new comments about the case. And what's interesting there is quite often there are people who had a sort of tenuous relationship to the community. They weren't there when Thompson disappeared. They weren't there, say, when Thompson's body was found. But they came around later. They came around to hear some of the gossip. But they kept that gossip to themselves, or they didn't feel it was important or pertinent enough to mention for 40, 50 years after the case. And in particular, um, once widespread public attention turned in the 1970s to the idea that Thompson might have been murdered, we see this suddenly a new burst of new testimony of people stepping forward to say, here's what I know, here's what I saw. And I think, as you're suggesting, the idea that somebody wants to sit and listen to me talk about my life, I have to have something interesting and worthwhile for them to hear. Turning to perhaps the more uh, sensationalistic or or sexy version of events or what may have happened to him, uh, the two are, I think, as you outline in the book, are the possibility that he committed suicide and then, of course, the possibility that he was murdered. I wonder if you could outline for us kind of the best case as to why he was suicide and then as you do in the book, maybe point out a couple of things that maybe undercut that, and particularly also with the murder one as well. Why do folks think he could have been murdered, but why does the evidence may not suggest that? Sure. Um, Well, as we've already talked about, certainly the the doctor on site at the time concluded that Thompson died by accident and that he drowned. And uh, the coroner who came around after Thompson was buried, he arrived at Canoe Lake a few hours after Thompson was buried, interviewed people on the scene at the time, and he agreed with the doctor's findings. So the doctor on site who examined the corpse and the coroner agreed that Thompson died accidentally by drowning. If we look at the correspondence uh, in 1917, there is some discussion, I think it starts in about uh, November or December of 1917, between Thompson's brother-in-law, T.J. Harkness, who was the executor of Thompson's estate, And he was writing back and forth to Canoe Lake, trying to resolve some outstanding bills and to get Thompson's personal effects returned, etc. And there's some mention there, and between Harkness and uh, Thompson's brother, George, that someone had heard gossip at Canoe Lake that Thompson had committed suicide. And the Thompson family is very upset by this. And they say, we want more information, we want to know who's telling these stories, and when they discover who's telling the stories, uh, Thompson's brother George writes a very angry letter uh, to the people involved, Shannon and Annie Fraser, and tells them that you are really disrespecting his memory, you have no proof for this, uh, essentially really calling them out for their activities. It seems like a very convoluted way to commit su- suicide as well. I, would the theory be that he jumped headfirst uh, into the lake and hit his head and uh, i mean if i'm not sure not that i'm planning a suicide but that just seems like perhaps a really uh low probability way of going about it i I think one of the things to keep in mind here is particularly with with those who theorize suicide they focus less on how he tried to commit suicide than on why he might have committed suicide so i think that question of if he was suicidal and decide to commit suicide to row out into the middle of a lake where he knew there were lots of people around, I mean, relatively lots of people around, on a calm day, um, and then try to commit suicide by either drowning himself, by knocking his head on the side of the canoe or something like that, seems a little implausible at best. Uh, 
Um, particularly, and I think as I raise in the book, the idea that he knew there was an active railroad in the region. He had access to things like knives and axes. He had access to lots of weapons. Um, all these sorts of things available to him that if he wanted to, you know, was truly intent on uh, ending his life, there would seem to be far surer ways of doing that than trying to drown himself by falling out of his canoe. But uh, I think one of the things that I talked about earlier is, is the idea that with the suicide theory, what has been focused on more is why Thompson might have committed suicide rather than how he committed suicide. And there's been all sorts of speculation that uh, he was disappointed with his art career. He didn't feel things were moving forward quickly enough. There is also, and there's been much made of this, speculation that uh, a, a woman, some say Thompson had a romantic relationship with, a woman named Winnie Trainer, who sometimes holidayed at the lake, that she was pressuring him to get married. And in the 1970s, it was proposed that, in fact, uh, he was so uh, felt kind of entrapped or not sure how to get out of this situation that the only way he could see out was to commit suicide. It's also been proposed that this woman, in fact, may have become pregnant by Thompson, and she was pressuring him that we, you know, particularly given the values of the time, they would have to be married, um, and that either you know, becoming a father or being forced into marriage because this woman was pregnant, he could not bear, and so he committed suicide due to that. Now, she's often portrayed as almost suffering from mental illness, it seems like, to, to some degree, or her character seems to be uh, attacked a bit by different different folks along the way. Do you have any, any sense about that uh, in regards to her? I think there are a couple of ways of looking at her. One of the, the things I found particularly interesting is that we do have letters written by her to the Thompson family in um, the fall of 1917. And we also have descriptions by Thompson family members uh, between each other t- referring to her. Her name is Winnie Trainer, Winifred Trainer, And Trainer was actually the one who, who took the impetus, uh, took the initiative to contact the Thompson family in July 1917 to ensure that they knew he had been buried at Canoe Lake. So she uh, left Canoe Lake the day he, he, the day he was buried, and when she reached um, the, the closest telegraph station, or the, closest, uh, the closest contact to the outside world, she immediately contacted the Thompson family to say, what do you want done? And the Thompson family, particularly um, Tom's sister Margaret, was so grateful that this woman, who she had no contact with, never knew before, had made such an effort to, to help the family. And she said this woman was, was so nice trying to contact undertakers for them in the area. She knew the people in the area, and she was really helpful. What happened over time is we can see in, in trainers' letters to the family, they, they tend to have uh, sort of um, scattered trains of thought. And even the writing style, you know, sort of the regular left-to-right lines across a sheet of paper, and then... Uh, vertically in the margins, and then upside down in the top margins, and all sorts of little scribbled notes in the side. And it does seem a, a little bit strange, a little unorthodox. And that's certainly how Trainer has been described later. Even the Thompson family, um, they have occasion to meet her in Toronto uh, during the Canadian National Exhibition in the fall of 1917. And their takeaway from that meeting is that she's not quite mentally balanced. And they pretty much end their association or contact with her from that time forward. Taken up in the 1970s, because she kind of leaves the picture for you know 50 years or so, she gets brought back in in the 1970s by Roy McGregor, and he is a distant relative of her by um, a distant relative of hers by marriage, and he certainly talks about the idea that she was perceived as. Um, you know, a bit of a troublesome personality or a bit of a troubled personality and uh, a little bit unorthodox in her behaviors and that sort of thing. And that's been the characterization that has pretty much stuck since the 1970s. And, and what are her claims? Do we have uh, uh, evidence from her in writing from interview where she does strongly assert that they, they were engaged or involved to be in, in some love affair or even the pregnancy? Does she, does she speak to that to, to anyone at any point? The only records we have from her that are incontrovertible, that are letters written by her, are from 1917 in her correspondence to the Thompson family. 
And in those letters, she makes no reference to her and Tom being engaged. She makes no reference to them having any kind of romantic relationship. She ter- certainly talks about that he was, you know, seemed like a, an upstanding man who she had respect for. But that is as far as her commentary goes. Anything else that's been reported as coming from her is hearsay that people say, oh, well, she told me this, or I heard this about her, but we have no clear statements from her after 1917 that address this topic. Let's turn to the conspiratorial kind of angle to this, and that's that Tom Thompson was murdered. Who would, be, who would have motive to murder Tom Thompson, and what evidence is there around this that, that could suggest that it happened? There have been a lot of theories proposed as to who might have motive to murder Tom Thompson. Um, there's a, a few people who are sort of the prime candidates. One of them is Shannon Fraser, uh, the man who operated Moet Lodge where Thompson was staying. Uh, Thompson had loaned him $200. It was reported a couple of years preceding that, and some claim that uh, he asked Fraser to repay that money. A fight ensued, and either Thompson died during, shortly after the fight, or that the fight kind of dribbled over into the next day, and Thompson was murdered later. There was another man who was staying at the lake uh, named Martin Bletcher Jr. He was an American tourist who summered at the lake, and there are some reports that Thompson and Bletcher may have gotten in a fight uh, regarding the war effort. Uh, this is 1917, of course, so the war in Europe is raging, and um, there was there's belief that Bletcher was sympathetic to the Germans, or as an American, they had just entered the war, and he may have thought it was a bad idea, and that some say Thompson you know, was a strong supporter of Canada's war effort, and so they got in a fistfight about the war. Others suggest that Bletcher and Thompson may have been competing for Winnie Trainer's interests and got in a fight over her. There are some who have suggested that Thompson... Um, didn't die in a fight with either of those men, but that he ran into a poachers in the park, and the poachers killed him. Uh, So there's a variety of theories, uh, and those certainly aren't all of the candidates, but those are some of the prime candidates for who and how Thompson might have been murdered. So given how much research you've done on this topic, if I was to ask you to kind of break down the, the, the three leading options being accidental death, suicide, or murder, what are your percentage breakdowns on those looking like? (laughs) <laughs> I've never had to think about the question as a percentage breakdown, so that sort of catches me a bit off guard. I think what I try to do in the book is uh, to go through each of those main theories. So the, the book is kind of three parts. The first one is looking at the 1917 evidence. Second part is looking at all the stories told since 1917 and the sort of the sense making that's gone on about that. And then with a clear picture of how we've ended up with the stories we've ended up with, Um, going back to each of those three theories. And without giving too much away, two of those theories I find sorely wanting for evidence, that a lot of what has been introduced and used to to argue for those positions is evidence that's quite flimsy, that's hearsay, that didn't come along until sometimes 40, 50, 60 years after the fact, and that often contradicts the evidence we have from 1917 written down by people who were on the scene at the time. Is there any Rosetta Stone kind of out there? As a researcher, you're just kind of waiting to come out. Is there any kind of, pardon the pun, magical bullet uh, that would really turn this thing on its head one way or the other? Or are we essentially at a point, given almost 100 years ago, 99th anniversary, just, just a day or so ago, is there any other information we can gather? Or do you think this is kind of where we're going to be at for a while? I can't see... At this point, radical new evidence coming forward or being discovered that would really change the case. Perhaps barring one thing, there has been gossip that um, a relative, a descendant, or, sorry, I should say a relative of Winnie Trainers, has some kind of correspondence showing that Tom and Winnie were engaged. Many people have asked this relative to produce those letters, and he never has. If those letters were were produced, it would lend a lot more credence to some of these theories. Barring that, unless someone out there inexplicably wrote down in 1917 that they killed Tom Thompson or an account of what happened, as I said, I can't see any new radical evidence coming forward that would change our understanding. And so what we are left with is looking at the evidence that we currently have. We can make some fairly plausible, defensible 
analysis and assessment of that evidence once we take away all of these sort of groundless stories that have accumulated over the last hundred years. Before we go, a kind of a procedure question for you, uh, which, which I find interesting. I recently did a, a podcast on the Black Donnellys. And to keep track of all the different stories and all the different family members, I literally was using giant pieces of paper, drawing arrows, you know, almost like a madman trying to keep the different versions and everything straight. I'm curious, the book is so well researched and um, draws these, these, these stark comparisons. How did you manage to keep track of all this information at once? Because it really is incredible, the detail you have here. Well, thank, well, firstly, thank you so much. I, I really do uh, appreciate your kind words about the book. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned earlier an interview you did with Dmitry Anastakis. And one of the things um, that Dr. Anastakis used for, for his research for his book was a site called Death on a Painted Lake, um, the, the Tom Thompson tragedy. And, and why I bring that site up is that was a site that I produced, uh, launched in 2008. And what we did was try to gather together a lot of historical documents, archival information about Thompson's life and his death, and to digitize that, to make it available as a teaching tool online. And so having collected a lot of that information almost a decade ago and and kind of sat on it since then and wanted to return to the story for the 100th anniversary of Thompson's death. And as you describe, I had a a few different strategies, of course, uh, running Excel spreadsheets to try to track not only the documents, the relationship between people, but also elements of the story. So, for instance, the idea that Thompson was in a fight the night before he died. When did that story first appear? After it first appeared, who took it up? Who didn't take it up? What elements got taken from it by who? You know, and how did the sort of genealogy, if you will, of the stories. Um, Word files trying to do much the same kind of thing. So, So multiple paths to try to keep track of all of this information. And and as you sort of mentioned at the open of our interview, um, one of the things that emerged is kind of like crime scene notes, that really trying to see who said what to whom, who got repeated later, or what got repeated later by whom, and, and how does that come to influence our thinking about this case. In writing this book, I recognize that not everyone is going to be familiar with who Tom Thompson is or the Group of Seven. Not everyone's going to be interested in the art history angle of things. And so what I've really tried to do in this book, and I think your listeners might be sympathetic to it, is to bring in a number of threads. So environmental history, the history of Algonquin Park, some political history about how this area got added to the province, some uh, history about art and life in Toronto during the early 20th century, uh, concerns around masculinity in the First World War, uh, also just all these elements of a, a crime, a true crime who done it. that someone's looking for, a, say, a good holiday read, they're going to the cottage, uh, you know, something to read on the back porch on the, the hot weekend. Hopefully there's enough here for a whole variety of types of readers that they find something of value and interest in the book. The book is The Many Deaths of Tom Thompson, Separating Fact from Fiction. Gregory Cloggis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And thank you for joining us. If you're enjoying the episodes, we'd love to get a five-star review from you on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. For more information about our tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, please visit our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. I always love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any show ideas or suggestions, please feel free to email me. My mail address is jim at hauntedwalk.com. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. Thank you.